Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation with Dr. Dawn Wright, Chief Scientist of the Environmental Systems Research Institute, which is better known as ESRI. ESRI has been described as the place where data meets geography. Their mapping technologies use GIS or geographic information system software to layer data over geographical maps. ESRI helps uh, their customers find oil, manage cities, predict flash floods, and manage supply chains in real time. Their systems are also being used today to address pressing environmental challenges by making it possible for scientists and engineers to visualize vast amounts of data with key indicators. As Esri's chief scientist, Dr. Wright works to strengthen the scientific foundation for Esri software and services, pushing the boundaries of what the software can do, especially in the context of ocean sciences. Dr. Wright is a world-renowned expert in ocean exploration, marine geology, and marine geography. She has led development of data science for the oceans, focusing on data quality, open science, and the development of spatial analytical tools to define the ocean, oceanic realm. Her passion for ocean stretches back for the ocean stretches back to her childhood in Hawaii, where she decided to become a marine geologist when she was eight years old. After receiving her bachelor's degree in geology from Wheaton College, she earned a master's in oceanography from Texas A&M University, and she studied marine, where she studied marine geophysics. She went on to complete her PhD in physical geography and marine geology at UC Santa Barbara, and her dissertation there focused on applying GIS to mapping the deep ocean floor. She did a postdoc at NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and then she spent 17 years as professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State University, where she built a pioneering GIS program. She joined her current role at Esri 10 years ago, and she now works with scientific and environmental communities worldwide to find new ways to use this GIS tool for ocean, seafloor, and coastal mapping, and for analysis of terrains, ecosystems, and different types of habitats. In her own exploration, she has taken part in more than 20 research expeditions on seagoing research vessels, and she's also done three dives in the deep submergence vehicle Alvin, which many of you may have heard of, and two dives in a submersible Pisces 5. She has authored or co-authored more than 150 articles and 10 books on marine GIS, on hydrothermal activity and tectonics of mid-ocean ridges and marine data modeling. This includes marine and coastal geographical information systems, one of the first books on marine GIS. Her extraordinary work over the years has won her numerous honors and awards. This include an NSF Early Career Award, a Fulbright Grant, and the National Academy of Sciences Roger Revel Commemorative Lecture Award. She is a fellow of the Explorers Club, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Geographical Society of America, the American Association of Geographers, the Oceanography Society, and the California Academy of Sciences. And just last week, she was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And if you want to follow her on Twitter, which I encourage you to do, her handle is Deep Sea Dawn. Not hard to remember. Uh, Dr. Wright's work has a number of close connections with what we do here at Carnegie, the research of our Carnegie scientists. So, in, in fact, now our researchers are talking with Esri about tools that might be able to support their work in seismology and volcanology. We're looking at ways that we can use these mapping technologies to learn more about agricultural runoff and the damage those agricultural chemicals can inflict on waterways. And of course, these technologies are incredibly valuable to Carnegie scientists who are working to understand climate change and its impacts on the world's oceans. Today, uh, our Q&A, our questions and answer period with Dr. Wright, which comes after she speaks, will be moderated by Dr. Rick Carlson. Rick is a geo and cosmochemist who studies the evolution of Earth's crust and early history of the solar system amongst several other fascinating areas. And Rick is also the director of our Earth and Planets Laboratory. So like you, I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Wright's thoughts on the ways we can use these types of digital technologies to enable outstanding science. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wright. Thank you so much, Eric. This is, uh, it's a wonderful to, to be with uh, all of you, although virtually. And uh, I'm so very happy to be uh, speaking uh, on this very important topic. So I'm going to share my screen now. And from my end, it looks like everything is working. So what I want to uh, focus on today 
uh, is, is something that I think will resonate with, with all of us uh, in the audience. This is, this is the idea of use-inspired science, which is really fundamental cutting-edge science that is also more readily responsive to society's needs, which is so important today. And I think we're seeing an amazing proliferation of use-inspired science in almost all arenas of science but especially around the topics of sustainability science, resource use, energy, health, all of this with an eye toward planetary resilience. And at ESRI, we see use-inspired science in, in three ways. One is how the Earth works. And geospatial, by way of Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, is indeed helping scientists to gain better insight and understanding of Earth process and function. And this is mainly in the natural science field, such as geology, ecology, oceanography, climatology, cryospheric science, conservation biology. And in this way, a reliable, verifiable spatial analysis and visualization is what GIS brings to the table to help these physical scientists answer a myriad of questions and these are mainly questions about spatial patterns in the natural environment, in the geosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and what is responsible, what process is responsible for those patterns. So that's how the Earth works, but there's also how the Earth looks. And this is essentially about how we as human beings have changed the Earth's appearance and function as illuminated by linkages between natural science and social science. Also in science partnerships that work across disciplines, across geographies and organizations. And here we often use geospatial to interactively and iteratively create and evaluate alternative designs. And we often call these geodesigns that help us make better decisions, especially with land cover for land use planning green infrastructure planning, urban planning, and again, sustainability science. And finally, there is how we look at the Earth. Success, successfully understanding how the Earth works and how the Earth looks to us requires an integrative and innovative approach to observation and measurement. So how we look at the Earth is literally about how we observe the Earth in varying forms. Sensors on satellites, aircraft, drones, ships. This is also about the important data science issues of analysis and modeling, developing and documenting useful data sets for science, interoperating between these data sets and between various approaches. And so GIS has now become the modern platform for the open sharing of data and for compelling science communication uh, at a multitude of scales. So this is all because of what we must acknowledge now, that the, the world today is in trouble. Our Earth is in trouble. Our time is running out. And the need for effective decision-making and policy is, of course, paramount. So it's safe to say that what we've done with environmental degradation and the issues of social instability these are creating a number of crises that are incredibly overwhelming, and they're all interconnected. Climate change, natural disasters, loss of nature, overpopulation. COVID, of course, is in the middle of this, including the linkage between the loss of our biodiversity and habitat and the prevalence uh, of these new diseases that will cause pandemics. Addressing all of these issues is going to be challenging for all of us and likely for the rest of our lives. So my thesis today is that our world needs geospatial because geospatial is special. Yes, there are the latitude and longitude points, lines, and areas that we observe and map on the Earth's surface, the Earth's subsurface, the atmosphere, even in outer space and on other planets. It's also the photography and the videography and the other imagery, the seismics, the surfaces and volumes of earth and ocean parameters. Geospatial lies at the heart of just about everything that matters to us on and in the earth. And for a range of important questions such as where 
and how to best sustainably feed a rapidly growing population, where to ensure resilient water supplies, where to address hot spots of rapidly declining ocean oxygen and increasing ocean acidification, where and when to best establish and enforce additional protected areas, both on land and in the ocean, where to mitigate and adapt to a changing climate. All of these are inherently uh, geospatial issues. So we know, uh, as you all know and participate in, we live in this wondrous scientific age where we now have access to a synoptic, an overall view of the entire planet and its various perils. As in this satellite view of tree canopy cover loss in purple and tree cover gain in green with the population density, density uh, overprinted uh, on top of this. We can even see uh, how the earth essentially is breathing in and out. So let me show you another visualization that is uh, incredibly compelling. So oftentimes this visualization is entitled, The Earth Has Lungs. Watch it breathe seasonally in and out. And this is an award-winning visualization by NASA and Oregon State University of a Goddard Space Flight Center supercomputer model of carbon dioxide levels, which are the reds and the oranges and the yellows, as well as carbon monoxide levels uh, in the whites that you can see in the lower hemisphere at this time of the year, all in the Earth's atmosphere, of course. And we can use a much more accurate uh, adaptive composite uh, map projection as well that is uh, helping us to to see this visualization uh, in various ways and this type of adaptive composite map projection is now being implemented in our ArcGIS software as well. So again, our world needs geospatial, but beyond the, the beautiful visualizations that I've shown, our world needs something like a human nervous system, a kind of nervous system that's intelligent and responsive, that creates even more understanding and more collaboration and systematic collaborative action. And so geospatial is essential to making that, that happen. Now, now, how is this actually done? Well, this is what our founder, Jack Dangerman, refers to as a geospatial infrastructure, which is perhaps a very fortunate term given President Biden's plan for infrastructure and the ongoing discussions in the House and the Senate at the moment. But what we're referring to here as geospatial infrastructure, this is the software, the hardware, the informatics uh, infrastructure for field operations and, and mapping for visualizing data, of course, for managing all types of projects, for the analysis and the data science that helps us to bring the data to life in terms of interpretations. And then there are also the dashboards that you have likely uh, seen or heard about now, especially because of the famous COVID-19 Johns Hopkins University dashboard by Professor Lauren Gardner's team at their Center for System Science and Engineering that's built on our technology and supported by our product engineering teams with billions of views since the start of the pandemic. And then there are also story maps, which helps us to communicate. It's a science communication tool. So, so all of this is really uh, information technology capabilities that are being supplied to the planet to scientists and to policymakers. So this concept of geospatial infrastructure is very important. And it's also about extending these more traditional technologies to the edge. So on the left of this diagram, you're looking at the various interconnected parts of a geospatial infrastructure that includes uh, things like the internet of things or various federal models that help us to, to track stream flow, for instance, such as the National Water Model, 
All of these are powered by analytics and data management, but we can push these technologies to the edge, to the right, for instance, on this diagram, because there is distributed, what we call distributed edge computing on emerging edge devices, such as uh, the FirstNet infrastructure for deploying, operating, maintaining, and improving the first high-speed nationwide wireless broadband network, especially for first responders, uh, public safety, or there's TV white space, which takes advantage of the unused spectrum in between TV stations to send out data and various signals. It also means in the lower right having a complete geospatial infrastructure out in the field on research vehicles or uh, other types of trucks, tractors, all kinds of devices, all supporting GIS workflows in all of these environments. And to this extent, what we're seeing now is a, ge a global geospatial framework that's emerging with organizations uh, full of scientists and policymakers, including citizen science groups. They're all seeking to share data sets and services. They're dramatically extending the impact of geographic information systems, or GIS. This is all with an eye toward helping the Earth data that we're all collecting and working with to achieve its full benefit. And of course, the people doing this are the scientists, the policymakers, the conservationists, the GIS professionals, uh, citizens, because we are now able to get this technology in the hands of just about everyone. And all of these different types of, of people, workers, they're applying the science of geography uh, almost everywhere and creating independent and focused systems and projects, uh, really building what we hope will be a socially accessible infrastructure and opening new opportunities for science communication, again, for informed decision-making and policy. And we're very glad to see how the Biden administration is really taking this to heart and hopefully collaborative uh, action. So I want to, to show you now some examples that may be of particular interest to this audience, keeping in mind that I'm staying on the, the theme of the use-inspired spectrum of science. So here we are in Australia, and during the horrible Australian bushfires of December 2019, NASA's Terra satellite flew over the eastern coast of Australia, which you can see there, and it captured one of the most impressive 3D smoke plume data sets ever seen with the multi-angle imaging spectral radiometer or MISER instrument. And using data from this overpass, the NASA Disasters Program, in collaboration with the Active Aerosol Plume Height Project, developed the first ever interactive 3D visualization of MISER fire plume height data, which you're looking at here. The 2D uh, raster, or the 2D grid of the same data is shown on the ground, along with modest hot spots in red. And the smoke plumes have been exaggerated around 20 times to better show uh, the detail of the plume. Now, these data have been really important for researchers and disaster management agencies in terms of understanding the big picture of the location and the intensity of fires in the region. And this same type of work is being done, for instance, with the California fires because this informs predictive models of where the smoke is likely to go, what regions may be affected downwind. And in this specific application, NASA worked with the Australian Bureau of Meteorology to improve the air quality forecasts for these fires using this Earth observation data and the NASA, the NASA disasters program. Uh, in concert, they continue to study the short and long-term impacts and risks from these fires again associated with air quality, aviation, wildlife and ecosystems, and, and climate dynamics. So this is a, a wonderful example of how geospatial is really, really needed here. And our spatial statistics team at ESRI took this one step further by building these directional uh, distributions or standard deviation ellipses that summarize the spatial characteristics uh, of the geographic features of these plumes, such as the central tendency, the dispersion and the directional trends uh, in the smoke. I'm going to show you uh, even more here uh, because there is lots to show. 
So even more examples here. This is yet another example from the NASA Earth Science Disaster Program, which has continued their great work by mapping the recent volcanic ash cloud from this month's big eruption in uh, St. Vincent, Caribbean. And this again was captured uh, by Mizar, Miser, the Miser sensor in 3D. And once again, uh, they've achieved the most advanced 3D visualization of Miser uh, observations from a volcanic plume uh, yet developed. Another example comes from uh, the terrible situation in Beirut. This is what in the center here. This is 3D drone captured data of the August 2020 Beirut explosion. And the, the model there was originally rendered in Sketchfab, which is a leading platform for 3D and augmented reality. And then we have integrated that model with the damage proxy map in our software uh, that you're seeing there showing the surface change from yellow to red, indicating more significant, the more significant chance uh, of building damage due to the explosion. And these classifications, it's uh, moving out a bit too much here, so let me just go back. So the red and the yellow are showing the chances of where the most significant uh, damage occurred. And those classifications were derived from synthetic aperture radar from Copernicus uh, Sentinel-1 satellites. Yet another example here is this uh, water balance app. And by the way, all of these uh, examples, all of these apps, I'm going to give you the URL so that you can use these resources yourselves. The water balance app uh, allows you to quickly analyze and graph decades of changes in Earth's water bu budget for soil moisture, uh, for uh, snowpack precipitation, uh, evapotranspiration, uh, runoff. So you can go to, if I go to uh, your part of the world with, in Carnegie Science here, uh, it will give you the uh, accompanying uh, information about soil moisture uh, in that area, including uh, how the uh, budget uh, in soil moisture, uh, the storage uh, in uh, the water column, the, the water table here uh, changes over time. Uh, it lets you visualize the impacts uh, in, in these different uh, parameters on uh, various uh, ecosystems. So the Water Balance app is uh, very, very useful for understanding this on a global scale and also a regional scale. In terms of vessel traffic, we are now able to track the signals from Automatic Identification Information Systems, or AIS, feeds uh, from shipping traffic. So this is giving you a quick visualization of cargo shipping traffic uh, around the uh, U.S. Uh, where fishing vessels are, and again this is for June 2020, Passion, passenger vessels, tankers, uh, and so this will allow you to look at these uh, different patterns and to actually download the data for further analysis, and it gives you a very nice a view of all of these different types of shipping traffic, the U.S. vessel traffic uh, ecosystem, uh, all the way back to 2017. There are all kinds of ways of viewing data, and uh, this, of course, is one of my favorite. This is the One Ocean app, which shows you all of the oceans of the world as they truly are one ocean. Uh, it draws on data from our ecological marine units, 52 million observations of temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, nutrients. You're looking at a temperature map right now, and wherever uh, the cursor moves, it gives you the vertical profile in temperature down through the entire water column from zero to 600 meters depth. You can see what this looks like at different depths. So this is at 175 meters depth with the accompanying vertical profile. Uh, you can also look at this in terms of, of salinity uh, for the world's oceans and the profile changes in terms of where you, you point to. But the other fascinating thing about this is the projected coordinate system that we're using to show this one ocean 
which is the Spielhaus uh, coordinate system. If you're familiar with Athelstan Spielhaus, he was a prominent meteorologist and oceanographer, and he worked uh, to develop this wonderful map that he published with National Ge Geodetic Survey colleagues in 1979, but he never was able to develop, uh, to, to share uh, the equations or the methods. Uh, fast forward to a couple of years ago, and our projection geometry team actually uh, did the mathematics necessary to extend Spielhaus's equations so that they could be uh, incorporated into a modern mapping system such as ArcGIS and then to add a myriad uh, of data sets to that including uh, global current vectors, current direction and speed uh, for the entire world ocean from a, uh, the DRACAR consortium uh, oceanographic data. And of course, with this being Carnegie Science, we have to go to uh, another planet. So this is the uh, Explore Mars uh, app that was done uh, by our 3D team in collaboration with NASA JPL. And so you have a virtual globe uh, of the entire planet of Mars, uh, including a Mars base map for Mars elevation uh, instead of uh, Earth elevation. And it's a wonderful way to explore the different locations on the planet. So everybody wants to go to the Perseverance uh, rover site uh, lately. And so you can uh, fly to that site. You can see what social media has been associated with these, these sites by the little Twitter symbols there. And if you uh, click on this study area, you get a little bit more information about the Perseverance target landing area and many, many other areas uh, in this fantastic 50-year uh, archive of data that we have now from NASA in terms of, of looking at the planet Mars. And finally, uh, I wanted to show this story map. And the story maps are free and open media for sharing not only maps, and associated data, photos, videos, and sounds, but for telling a specific and compelling story by way of that content. And this is all done with sophisticated map, map making functionality that's easily built into, it's already built into the app, so you don't have to be uh, an advanced GIS expert or cartographer. And I wanted to just quickly share this coastal flooding story because especially on the east coast of the U.S., how coastal communities are being impacted by sea level rise uh, is a critical, critical issue. And this was a wonderful story that was told by Old Dominion University in collaboration with NOAA and with us, with many, many critical uh, parts to understanding this issue overall in terms of what is coastal flooding, what are the uh, data telling us about this, what coastal communities are affected, what can we do, what are the various resources? And I wanted to really uh, dive into this uh, for a little bit longer, especially given, uh, I think one, one thing that Rush Holt, who president of, of the AAAS, said very eloquently a couple of years ago on the need for scientists not only to tell stories, but to tell the story of the evidence or tell the story of the questions to be answered. And this is a really important part of science com communication, which is sorely needed now in the public square. So I think this story map is a wonderful example of this, uh, kind of setting the stage in terms of what is coastal flooding, what are the terms associated here, storm surge, abnormal high tide events, persistent wind and waves, showing you some places where this is a huge issue, such as Kiribati and other uh, low-lying islands uh, throughout the world in the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Certainly we're all familiar with New Orleans. And in this particular story map, you also have these inset maps, which allow you to, to zoom in to the very high resolution imagery uh, that is uh, inserted into the map so that you can explore uh, further. There's Rotterdam, Bangladesh, all of those have the inset maps. And what are the data actually telling us? So this is a very communicative global map that shows the relative sea level trends 
uh, in different parts of the world in terms of is sea level trending upward or, or downward according to the, the isostatic and the other climate change uh, conditions? What can we tell in terms of uh, time series? So this is a map that actually allows you to swipe uh, in terms of areas that are likely to experience flooding due to sea level rise uh, in blue. And the areas that are in green are the low elevation areas that are going to be most susceptible to sea level rise. And how is it possible for us to uh, prepare uh, in terms of understanding these uh, inundation data sets? So Norfolk is always a great example here, not only in terms of where sea level rise uh, will extend, but what infrastructure will be affected by that. So the red here represents buildings and roadway, roadways, excuse me, at the highest risk, uh, followed by orange areas and yellow areas that are uh, less impacted, but still to be impacted for sure in a 2040 scenario and a 2060 scenario of sea level rise. This even goes out to a climate model that predicts out to 2080. Uh, and there's much more uh, in this very wonderful story map, including additional resources. So in terms of a science communication uh, device, I can't say enough uh, about story maps. So now I am almost to the end here, but I could not resist in, in giving you a sneak peek at a project that will not be officially launched until this summer. And this is a project that is driven by the continued need for trusted, accessible, and high resolution global land cover, uh, and ultimately land cover on demand to improve our planning and to monitor our change, especially for agricultural uh, use and conservation use as well. And this is an initial collaboration among uh, ESRI, Microsoft, and the Impact Observatory, which is a, a fairly new company that brings machine learning and deep learning algorithms and data to bear for sustainability and environmental monitoring. And right now, what we are doing is building a global land cover map uh, built from deep learning models. And we're also uh, evaluating and sharing those deep learning, learning models. And we're working on six test sites that you can see uh, sort of lit up on this map, the uh, U.S. West Coast, uh, Costa Rica, uh, Tanzania and Rwanda, Thailand, and, and South Af Africa. And this is quite remarkable because this is a 10 meter resolution global land cover map. Uh, it's a, it uses a 10 meter near cloud free mosaic uh, produced by the Impact Observatory with Microsoft using uh, Sentinel-2 which uh, many of you know that Sentinel-2 is a very high resolution optical sensor and the data will be hosted on Microsoft's planetary computer. And the training of the deep learning models will be provided by the Dynamic World Project in association with the National Geographic, Google, and the World Resources Institute. And so right now the, the models are, are being trained and the first, the first results are very, very promising. So this is a first look at the classification of the Sentinel-2 data uh, along the Mekong uh, River Delta, uh, very strong classification accuracy in forested areas, urban areas, small settlements, you just follow the legend on the bottom. And uh, we are working hard to improve this in grassland and scrub areas. And we here are tracing the expansion of the built area uh, around and extending from Munini, uh, Rwanda. So we'll have more to say about this later on in the summer. And everything that I've shown is really part of what we are fostering in terms of open science, open services, open data, access for uh, NGOs, governments, citizens, uh, making our publications, our data, our applications, our source code, as findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as possible. Those are the fair uh, open data and open science principles that you see on the far, on the far left. 
And uh, Esri is very, very lucky to be working with a, a loosely connected network of, of organizations. We have millions of users and thousands of business partners, but we're working in special collaborations, both informal and formal, with the organizations that you see in yellow, such as the National Geographic and, of course, Microsoft, the, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, and we hope Carnegie Science will be added to this uh, very soon. In fact, we should add Carnegie Science to this. And what we're trying to do here is to uh, build a, a whole series of digital experiences uh, towards all of these different goals, the earth science modeling, certainly, but uh, the forecasting, the geodesign, the biodiversity conservation use, the global sustainability uh, in line with the uh, sustainability development goals. And uh, another big effort is our indicators of the planet, which is a great big report card of the earth. Uh, I'll just point you to livingatlas.arcgis.com slash indicators, because this is uh, updated uh, hourly for some of these data sets in terms of how the earth uh, as a unit, as a living organism, is doing in terms of air quality and coral bleaching, uh, even piracy and armed conflict. So uh, please enjoy that. And I, my timer did not start, so I'm getting the sense that I'm at or over 40 minutes. But at any rate, uh, I am at the end of my presentation, and I thank you so very much for your attention, and I hope this was uh, enjoyable and informative, and I now uh, look forward to the question and answer. And you can reach me at the email address uh, below. Uh, social media is uh, indeed at Deep Sea Dawn, and I will make these slides available at esriurl.com slash Carnegie. Thank you, Dr. Wright. What a, what a fantastic presentation. And this array of applications, geospatial data is just amazing. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an earth scientist, so the thing that strikes me throughout your talk is that this is the only kind of analysis that lets us uh, transition from thinking about local phenomena as local and recognizing that many of these are actually connected at a global scale, uh, even a planetary scale. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there are a number of questions already in, uh, some quite good ones. So let me uh, read some to you. Uh, first one uh, is, uh, people frequently have difficulty understanding the ramification of scientific data due to social, economic, and political biases. How can geospatial infrastructure encourage the public to view GIS data as objective reality rather than as attractive but dismissible predictive modeling? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent, excellent question. And uh, really, it gets to the point of my talk where we want to go beyond the pictures, beyond the images, beyond the pretty visualizations to actually look at the, uh, the resources that go with those. So always, always when we share these visualizations or these apps, uh, there should be information about how the data were collected, uh, how it's possible to access and to reproduce the data because another uh, big movement is reproducibility and replicability uh, in terms of the, these data. You should be able to take these data and what we often encourage is for you to make your own applications, your own uh, apps. Uh, but a lot of what we foster in terms of documenting the data are indeed the implications for, for misuse, uh, at what scale and what resolution uh, the data are best use at, used at. Uh, what are, uh, are there any uh, privacy issues uh, associated with some aspects of the data? Uh, what are the various ways that the data can be uh, accessed by different sections or different parts of our, our society, not just by the, uh, the high-level scientific institutes, but can we make these uh, data and these workflows available to community groups, to small nonprofits, to small uh, sustainability or conservation groups, and a final uh, because I know a lot of these questions, we could have a whole seminar in this, but uh, I really want to emphasize workflow. The workflow, the steps that you take uh, from the collection of the data to the processing to the analysis. Uh, reveal what you did uh, to the, in the analysis to get you to the final map, uh, the map that is so uh, compelling. Why is it compelling? 
uh, and how accurate really what even what what are the uncertainties that are there in that analysis all that is part of the uh, allied documentation that goes along with with the the prettiness a fantastic description of the benefits of open science i, I really like that here's another question for you is uh what do you think is the future of geospatial enabled science you've shown us some amazing things examples here today what can't you do now that you think you'll be able to accomplish a decade from now well one of the uh the in terms of edge when i mentioned uh the edge of things the edge technologies we're still uh, working now with uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, that, that's still, I think, a frontier. I didn't have time to talk about the, uh, the integration of geospatial with gaming, serious gaming, in terms of these virtual worlds that we can create, not just for fun, but in terms of looking at uh, various predictive scenarios. For instance, if we let, um, if, if our air quality goes, if we let that go to a certain point, uh, what, what are going to be the, the consequences for uh, all aspects of our community, for the plants, for the humans, uh, for, for everything? So these types of virtual worlds is another part of this. I think we still have a long way to go with artificial intelligence and within that machine learning and uh, deep learning, those are parts, components of artificial intelligence, uh, training those algorithms so that they are making uh, more accurate uh, predictions. So that last example with the land cover is a very common use of uh, uh, deep learning, but uh, we need to get beyond just uh, classifying or identifying things in imagery to uh, making all kinds of different, very accurate predictions. I know there's a lot that's going on right now in terms of, of um, facial recognition uh, for, for policing and public safety and how those uh, algorithms uh, get many of us, uh, especially those of us of different ethnicities, wrong. And so uh, I think that's another area that we have uh, to make a lot of improvement in. Thank you. Uh, let's stick with one more, uh, more philosophical question and move on. There's a number of uh, uh, more detailed questions coming your way. Uh, but this one is, uh, do you find it challenging to inspire scientists to adopt a use-inspired approach as opposed to a basic research approach? Another great question. I find that is not difficult uh, these days, especially with uh, the current generation of young scientists, uh, the scientists who are working on their master or their PhD degrees, uh, the postdocs, the early career faculty, uh, those, we are producing scientists now who get that message now, how important it is. Even if you uh, look at the most basic of scientific questions, making that linkage to uh, inspired use to help society, a lot of young people, a lot of young scientists are very, very excited about that. So I think the the challenge is uh, giving them the tools in order to make that connection, uh, giving them the, the venues and the opportunities. So what I see while still being a university professor is that the institutional barriers uh, to that are coming down in terms of if you want to do use-inspired uh, science or you want your science to be, to have that societal benefit and you're doing extra things like podcasts or, or blogs or working with community organizations or doing producing special data sets those types of activities are now being recognized as worthy of tenure along with the the publications the the common pub, grantsmanship publications uh, service the three-legged stool of the academic uh, that three-legged stool is now being extended with with additional legs fantastic i, I love it uh, let's switch to some more uh, uh, detailed application questions now. There's some, some very interesting ones here. Uh, how can geospatial be used to address the problem of plastic waste in the ocean? Well, plastic waste is, is one that is, um, it's overwhelming uh, right now, but there's so many conservation organizations that are actually tracking, uh, they're using observations of plastic in the ocean uh, from satellites, from planes, uh, even from robots uh, in the oceans where they are sending signals of the uh, XYZ of where plastic is sited. Uh, and so we're able to, of course, put that on a map. 
uh, we're able to, the, the, uh, the more frequent those observations are, the better idea we have in terms of how uh, plastic uh, is, and this I'm talking about macroplastic because there is the problem of microplastic uh, that is an additional problem where we have to track uh, schools of fish that are in training uh, plastic uh, into their, their tissues. And so we're tracking those as well. But right now it's really a tracking, tracing, monitoring uh, problem. And so we have uh, the, the technology to do that quite readily now. Now that's on in the ocean. Of course, it's a big problem on land because the plastic that comes into the ocean is coming uh, from the land, mostly. Uh, there's been a big uh, emphasis on fishing gear uh, contributing plastic waste to the oceans, which is true, but the majority of it comes from uh, outflow, uh, river outflows into the oceans. And so uh, tracking that on land is also continually, continually ongoing. And that's a big uh, citizen science effort as well, where you can uh, map and track uh, plastic pollution, all kinds of pollution, upload it to these global databases and participate in the global monitoring uh, of where of where trash is on the planet. Is, is this, uh, I'll ask one of my own questions, is, is the data sources mostly satellite based or you can use ground based analyses as well? No, most of these are most of these are ground based, especially because of the resolution needed to identify individual pieces of, of pollution. Uh, so with the in, in the ocean, a lot of it is uh, shipboard observations. A lot of it is with uh, uh, these remotely operated uh, vehicles that are able to gliders that are able to transverse large uh, spaces of the ocean uh, without humans. Uh, and then for the, the very, very large uh, pools or garbage patches, uh, as they're called, uh, those are more readily sensed from uh, from aircraft uh, as well as from high resolution satellites. Very neat. Uh, here's a, another application. Uh, are geospatial tools able to show us how things about uh, how herbivory affects landscapes, such as bark beetle infestations, increasing fire risks? Are these tools not built for distinguishing that kind of detail? Yes, the tools are built for, for that level of detail. Uh, the, the exciting thing about geospatial right now is in terms of the, the different types of technologies can take you down to the centimeter scale of, of mapping, uh, all the way up to the mapping with the satellites. So uh, there are different numerical recipes that are uh, paired with different sensors, such as your phone is, is even a sensor, and so the apps uh, that are built for your phone are built for mapping uh, at that very close level of detail just as the different types of numerical recipes or algorithms that uh, are made for satellite observations are made for that broader uh, more global level of, of detail so a big question in geographic information science which is the science behind geospatial the science behind geographic information systems uh, is this uh, question of the, uh, the appropriateness of a methodology to the scale uh, of the problem. The scale being the, uh, the regional, the regional extent of the area, and then the resolution is the level of detail uh, of the sensor or of the data collection. So that continues to be a very important uh, research effort. Uh, there's a, a number of questions uh, on an important issue about open open data. Uh, here's one of them. Uh, won't making your source code open open the data to hacking and willful distortion? Uh, it most certainly could. And uh, one of the things about uh, open data is that it's it's not a situation where you just completely open up everything. Uh, there are some situations where uh, the the code uh, is still being worked on, is still being uh, refined, and so sometimes uh, software developers will put out a certain version uh, of the code. Uh, there are other times where it's not quite ready to be completely open, so we're still working on it and refining it, and then we'll open it at a certain stage, especially after we've had a chance to, to publish or to uh, to I'll have it reviewed, peer reviewed. 
so this is also a very, very interesting uh, situation in terms of how we are able to think about criminology, criminality, uh, criminality with data, criminality with um, how our data are used uh, without uh, the proper context used in ways to, uh, for instance, there was a big blow up in the 1990s about using GIS in the cockpits of uh, fighter planes in uh, Iraq. GIS to wage war, do we want that? Uh, can we prevent that? And uh, we do not have uh, all of the answers to that yet. Uh, but we have enough of us who are bringing to light these various misuses or misapplications of, of geospatial, uh, certainly in the academy. Uh, here's a question uh, that actually came from your, your images of uh, ocean currents. And I, I was fascinated. Uh, I was looking for the, the deep Atlantic uh, uh, currents in there. Uh, but uh, let me read the question. Are there any models that show how ocean currents are changing over time? In a recent trip to Antarctica, I learned about the Antarctic circumpolar current, which drives all the ocean currents of the world, including the Gulf Stream. If the Antarctic circumpolar current is impacted due to dis disappearing ice shelves, then the planetary impact could be Im immense. So it's a question of uh, uh, how these uh, uh, data sources can be used to, to model uh, predictive outcomes. Oh, absolutely. And what I showed in my example was just a 50 year average, a 50 year snapshot of global ocean currents. And I zoomed into to one particular area so you could see the symbology much better. But if I zoom back out, uh, that would have shown uh, a 50 year average of all of the world's currents uh, in that one ocean projected coordinate system. And the consortium that is producing that data set uh, does look at, look at the, uh, or they create predictive models uh, of currents based on the changing temperature regime in the oceans especially, and looking at uh, the temperature as well as the salinity regime, how that uh, creates uh, density differences uh, in the ocean in terms of the vertical thermal haline circulation of the ocean, as well as the surficial circulation, which is driven by, by wind of course. So yes, there are uh, all kinds of observations uh, from, from ships, from satellites, from buoys, but most importantly from the Argo network. It's a global network of over 4,000 floats that is giving us continual uh, observations of these parameters uh, in the ocean that allows us to make these uh, predictive models. So, so yes, that work is ongoing. And what I showed was just uh, one, one snapshot. Uh, let's see, we're getting towards the end here. Let me, uh, there's so many questions, we're never gonna get through all these. Uh, you, you clearly inspired the audience here. Uh, here's, let's take this as the last one. Uh, extraordinary if this can be used to indicate how to prevent climate change. What about tracking where the worst carbon plumes are? Can we do that and make the information public? Uh, absolutely, we, we can, uh, the, the problem that we have is not the, not the technology, not whether or not we can do or track many of these uh, environmental uh, variables. It's just, I think, really uh, getting the technology in place, uh, getting the funding to get the, the people and the technology in place. And so uh, oftentimes we are relying on political will and political funding to set up these observatories or to keep these types of, of, of observatories um, uh, maintained. So uh, yes, there, there are any number of these uh, uh, parameters that, that we can track. We, we, we do it now on a smaller uh, scale, but if we're talking about a national system of tracking these plumes or even several research projects in a uh, National Science Foundation funded consortium, uh, we need to keep those operations uh, funded. And a lot of that goes back to uh, what our government can do for us in that aspect, or even what the philanthropic uh, community can do. One of the things that we try to do at ESRI is to, uh, to give away our technology and our time and expertise uh, to help keep some of these monitoring projects going. So uh, the money that would normally be spent uh, to, to buy software or to buy expertise or to pay for expertise, 
uh, we will we will pour that into the uh, into the effort. It's part of what is um, uh, powering the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID dashboard because we we gave of our technology and our our infrastructure there to help Johns Hopkins uh, do their fantastic work with uh, the COVID mapping. That's had huge impact too. As a data producer myself, I'm very pleased by that answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, before we, we thank Dr. Wright for this amazing talk and particularly the discussion afterwards, you, you had some fantastic answers to these questions. I'd like to point out that the next uh, lecture coming up in Carnegie is uh, given by Lord uh, Martin Rees, who's the uh, Astronomer Royal of the uh, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, he's just written a book on the future, uh, Prospects for Humanity, and he'll be talking about the world in 2050 and beyond. Uh, this is on May 12th from 3 to 4 p.m. So Dr. Wright, uh, just, we thank you so much for your, your uh, talk today. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's, it's really been an educational experience and, and very uplifting too, I think. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>